who are going to experience persecution. So the work of evil that is going on in the world throughout history is going to affect God's people and Satan's people. Everyone's going to punish, be punished. And this runs true to everything that the Bible teaches. Jesus didn't find it easy when he's living on this earth. He was subjected to criticism and ridicule and accused and called by various names. Yet he was perfect, sinless. He was the son of God. But what does the Bible say? He came to his own. His own did not know him. Didn't recognize who he was. And the Pharisees, who were such students of the word of God, knew what was written on the page, but they didn't know how to understand what it meant in real life, and they rejected the Christ. Simply because they had not adequately understood and prepared themselves by reading and studying God's word. Well, how long is this going to last? Well, it's going to last for 42 months. Now, I've indicated on the board, I did this uh, up here to the upper right. Uh, this period of time is emphasized in four different ways. You can call it time, times, and half a time. Three and a half years, 42 months, or 1,260 days. Now, the reason I put all four of them up there is I want you to realize all four designations are designation of the church age. But they are used, interestingly, in different ways in the book of Revelation. Don't take my word for it. Check it out for yourself. My observation is that when you are reading time, times, and half a time, every time you read that, it's not zeroing in just on Christians or non-Christians. It's including everybody. Or when you talk about three and a half years, it's talking about everybody. But when you talk about 42 months, you can be sure that the emphasis is placed upon the non-Christians. When you talk about 1,260 days, you can be sure the emphasis is on God's people. Now, I'm just saying that they all refer to the church age, but there's an emphasis that's given here and here that is not quite so clear, if indeed it's there with these, it includes everything. Does that make any sense to you? Now, we're going to see that the two witnesses that we're going to come to here are going to witness for days but here he's talking about the nations, they will tread out underfoot the Holy City for 42 months. So who's he talking about? Using the term 42 months, he's talking about the work of the enemy. That's the clarification he gives by saying, same period of time, but I'm going to designate that by months. So check it out. Every time in the book of Revelation where you see months, observe very carefully the context in which you read that. It's talking about the work of Satan's people. When you read days, it's talking about the work of the church. And when you just read the other two, time, time, half time, or three and a half years, it's talking about either one, both. Uh, they're all included in what's being said in that particular picture. Um, so what is behind the phrase three and a half years or 42 months or time, time, half a time? What's behind that? Uh, William Barclay in his commentary, suggests that uh, this symbolic designation of the church age uh, probably came to the minds of people in thinking about the period of three and a half years from 168, uh, June of 168 to uh, December of 165 B.C., which is a period of time in which a battle was going on between Syria and Israel. And Jesus Epiphanes, a pagan ruler, was trying to destroy the religion of the Jewish people in Israel. That battle lasted three and a half years. And those historians who record the information for us suggest that this is a guerrilla warfare like nothing ever before. And it looked like there was no possible way that the Jews were adequate to protect themselves. But Antiochus and the army of Syria had desecrated their holy place, had outlawed their worship of God. And yet because they were really concerned about worshiping the true God, they hung in there, they fought valiantly, and after three and a half years of struggle, they drove the enemy out and they enjoyed the victory. You've heard me say this before. That's why at Christmas time when we celebrate the birth of Christ, the Jews celebrate Hanukkah, 
which is December of 165 BC, <laughs> when they were able to restore their worship, cleanse their temple, and continue on serving God. Now, there are other things that would suggest the meaning of three and a half years. Um, when I think of three and a half years, I think of the uh, time that it didn't rain upon the earth back in the days of Elijah. Why did he pray that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years? He didn't say three and a half years, but he prayed that it wouldn't. It's in the New Testament that we learn from uh, the book of James that it turned out to be three and a half years. This was to get Baal worship out of the picture. Because Baal's the one supposed to make it possible for your crops to grow. Send the rain and sunshine and all. Didn't work. Now when Elijah started praying and God began answering that prayer, did anybody know how long that drought was going to continue? No, they had no idea. But it did come to an end. And when it came to an end, it was approximately three and a half years. So we're talking about this period of time. We're talking about a period of time. We can date the beginning. The beginning of the church age was what day? Pentecost. Pentecost. When the church got started, the Holy Spirit came. Do we know the end? No, we don't. God knows. His Son doesn't. And we don't know. And the Bible makes it very clear that He doesn't intend for us to know. So that would be... Uh, well, let me mention one other one. Generally speaking, we think of the public ministry of Christ on this earth as being about three and a half years. Mm -hmm. That may have entered into the picture too. So I'm just thinking out loud here with you. Can't say that any one thing was definitively what is going to explain it, but uh, that might help us a little bit to understand how they might have understood this. Now the final picture, which is a tremendous picture of the two witnesses. Now, I put this on the board too because I just, uh, you know, you may not see it this way, but sometimes it helps me to uh, see things so I can visualize it. So I visualize this as a drama. I visualize my sitting in an auditorium and uh, in verses 3 and 4 where this picture starts, there's somebody out in front of the curtain saying, I want to tell you what you're about to see. Just a moment, the curtains are open and you expect uh, uh, to see this many actors in this Act 1. So after the explanation is given in verses 3 and 4, then we have three acts, and I've indicated three different acts, and I'll point them out to you as we come. Now, I usually when I do this, I tell the people, uh, you're going to love Act 1. I'm, I'm reading your minds. Don't disappoint me, please. <laughs> Anyhow, I think you're going to love Act 1. I don't think there's a person in this room that's going to like Act 2. In fact, you're probably thinking, I need to get out of here. Don't, don't stay around. Because you're going to be thrilled with Act 3. So let's, let's get at it. Verse 3, I will grant authority. Now this authority, I think, is reference to God's word. To my two witnesses. Now why do I say the authority refers to my two witnesses? Uh, the word authority should be in italics. That's not in the original Greek. Uh, it's just put there because that's a thought that's being expressed. Uh, I think they could have just as easily put the word of God there as well as the word authority. Because what is the basis of our power? It's the power of the word of God. Sharper than any two-edged sword, the way Hebrew 4 12 defines it. So I give this my word to my two witnesses. Now, the number two, symbolically, of strength. To my strong witness. Who's my strong witness? It's the Christian who preaches and teaches and lives the word of God in its purity. So that's a picture. So, folks, you are the main actor in this drama. You are the two witnesses. What are we going to do? We're going to prophesy. What does that mean? We're going to speak. What are we going to speak? Well, a prophet is somebody who speaks for. This is We are speaking for God. So what are we going to tell people? What God has told us. We're going to share the good news with others. They will prophesy for 1260 days. Now what do we say about days? We're talking about God's people. 
Not the wicked people. I'm talking about God's people. Same period of time, but described the days. But we, in this drama, are pictured wearing a garment of sackcloth. In Bible days, sackcloth was a garment of mourning, of sadness, of grief. Well, doesn't the Bible teach us that we should rejoice and be exceedingly glad? Aren't Christians supposed to be happy and on top of the world and filled with joy? I think so. But is there anything about the Christian life and the Christian witness that really burdens us and grieves us and saddens us? Sure there is. When we have somebody that we know or even don't know, except for the fact that we know that they're not a Christian, that bothers us. Are we happy about that? No. Are we happy about wrong behavior? No. Are we happy about ignorance of God's word? No. So why are they wearing this garment? Because though they have an inner peace that passes all understanding, they're concerned about others that don't have that peace, that don't have that promise, that don't have that assurance that God gives to his people. Now he further describes these two witnesses. That's us. What does he say? They are two olive trees. Now, what's the olive tree furnish? Olive oil. What do they use the olive oil for? To trim the lamps, to keep the light burning. What was the lampstand symbolic of in the Old Testament? It's symbolic of the Word of God. You remember when you went into the holy place, immediately to your left would be the lampstand, to your right was the table of showbread, directly in front of you was the altar of incense, so we see the Word of God, the Lord's Supper, and prayers. All this is involved in our assemblies on the Lord's Day. So here we are pictured now as uh, those who are two olive trees. That's the oil that kept the lamp burning. What Jesus said about Christians, you shall let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, we are also described as the lampstands. What does that mean? I don't have to guess. Chapter 1, verse 20 said, the lampstands refer to the church. So we are the church. We who make up the body of Christ are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Two olive trees gives emphasis to the Holy Spirit. That gives us power. Remember, when you and I were converted and we were baptized into Christ, at that moment, the conversion took place, and when he came up out of the waters of baptism, two things were realistic at that point. Number one, our sins were gone. Number two, the Holy Spirit moved in. So this is talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that enables us to live for him. So now that we've been introduced to the actors in the drama, let's come to Act 1, which will be covered in verses 5 and 6. If anyone, anyone, wants to harm them. Fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemy. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. They have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. Does that not bring to your mind the plagues of Egypt during the time of Moses? So what's he talking about? He's saying if anyone wants to harm them, who's he talking about? These two witnesses. Fire flows out of their mouth. What comes out of the mouth of the two witnesses? God's word. What does it do? Devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, that is, harm the Christian witness, he's going to be killed. What's going to kill him? The Word of God, presented here as fire. So, what do we have the power to do? We have the power to shut up the sky so that the rain will not fall during the days of the prophesying. They have power of the waters to turn them in blood, to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. So, the power of God is at work here. Let me talk a little bit about this word fire, I want to make sure you understand that there's reason for thinking that this is symbolic of the power of the Word of God. In Jeremiah 5, 14, 
Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, because you have spoken the word, behold, I'm making my words in your mouth fire, and this people would, and it will consume them. So it just simply means that the non-Christian is like wood that's going to be burned up by the truth that we live and that we proclaim from our lips. Let me give you another example from 2 Kings, the first chapter. Do you remember the story of Elijah at the time that uh, King Ahaziah had fallen through the lattice, became very ill, and uh, he thought, uh, I wonder if I'm going to survive this illness. I might die. But he wanted to know, so he sent a group of men to the uh, god of Ekron to find out if he would survive. So as they're making their journey to the god of Ekron, which is over on the Mediterranean coast, the uh, place where the Philistines live, uh, they encountered Elijah. And Elijah saw them and they engaged in conversation for a moment. And he said, where are you going? And they told him where? What are you going there for? They told him why. He said, men, you don't need to make that journey. There's a God right here. He'll answer that question for you. Your king is not going to survive. He's going to die. And so with that message, they returned back to the king. Now, obviously, they got there much more quickly than they were anticipated arriving. And King Ahaziah said, why'd you come back so soon? He said, well, we got the answer. He said, you haven't had time to go all the way to Ekron. He said, no, we met a man along the way that had the answer. Well, who was he? Hmm, forgot to ask his name. Describe him. So they described him, and the king knew who he was. I knew who that is. That's Elijah the Tishbite. So this angers the king. So he then sent 50 men with a captain over them out there to get the man of God. Now, where was Elijah when they came out to get him? He's up there on top of the hill. And uh, so rather than going up after him, the captain with his 50 men behind him, speaking very courageously, I've got 50 men here with me, come down. The king wants to see you, you man of God. What did Elijah do? He looked down at him and said, if I be the man of God that you say I am, let fire come down and burn all of you up. Fifty-one men burned. Now, somebody must have seen this because of the news of that fire was reported to the king. He's really angry now, so he sends a second group of fifty out. And the second group do go through the same experience. The captain says, Oh man of God, the king has said, come down. He said, If I be the man of God, you say I am let fire come down and burn you all up. Now we have 102 people who have been burned up. When the king heard about that, he sends a third group of 50 with a captain over them. Very persistent. You have to give him credit for that. When this third fellow came out, the captain, he's trembling in his boots. And God speaks to Elijah and says, uh, Elijah, that man is scared to death. Go down there and talk to him. So Elijah comes down from the hill and he said, Sir, if you know what's good for you, you're going to turn right around now and go back to your king and tell him what I said that first to that first group of men that came by. Your king is going to die. And so the captain took his 50 men and went back to see the king and said, You're going to die. And he died. Now, that's a strange story to me. But the, the thing that I like about it is, who is one man against 153 men dispatched by the king? And that one man is everything when he's God's man. And that's something every one of us needs to remember. With God for us, who dare be against us? In Psalm 27, David wrote, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I fear? No reason to fear anybody. Not when you're on the Lord's side. So uh, this emphasizes how fire was used literally, and now we're to understand it symbolically, just simply demonstrating the power of God that works through his word. Let me give you one other passage, Isaiah 55, 11. So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. 
So the fact that it comes out of the mouth indicates this is the message of God's word that we are to proclaim. Now, the power to shut the sky, I think, is emphasis of the power of prayer. Waters being turned to blood and striking the earth with every plague draws our attention to Moses in the days of the Egyptian plagues. As often as their desire is simply the willingness of Christians to trust in God and his power and continue to preach his word and see his word doing its job. Now, the interesting thing about the uh, ten plagues in Egypt is this Act 1 is speaking of the church during the first uh, 300 years. What happened during that 300 years? They grew. They surely did. But they faced tremendous opposition. The whole Roman Empire was against the church. And they were just a small group of people. Beginning with Nero in 60, in the 60s, continuing on with Domitian in the 90s, there were 10 successive major persecutions, each with the intent of destroying the church. The last one, the 10th one, came in 303 and 304, when Diocletian, after he had e issued three edicts, boasted of the fact, I have actually destroyed every copy of the Word of God. The church is annihilated. But following into the throne was a man by the name of Constantine. He saw a sign in the sky, thought he knew what that meant. And uh, so he wanted a copy of the Word of God. How could he have a copy of the Word of God? It had all been destroyed. When it made, was made known that he wanted a copy of the Word of God, he received 50 copies. How empty is the boast of those who war against God. So it's interesting to me that in the first act here, just as in Egypt there were 10 plagues, so in the Roman Empire there were 10, and these are secular historians that record all this, 10 major efforts to wipe out the church. And the church grew. And what's the story today? The church is very much alive. Roman Empire's history. Yeah. Now we come to Act 2. This is uh, in verse 7. When they have finished their testimony. Now I think this means when the Bible was completed. When the 27 books of the New Testament were finished. In other words, was Paul persecuted? Was he in prison? Yes, he did. Did imprisonment keep him from writing what God wanted him to write? Not at all. He wrote it. His books in the New Testament. Um, I think it refers to the 27 books in the New Testament being completed. The beast, which is the anti-Christian world power, that comes up out of the abyss. The abyss is a place that has no bottom. It's a place for the demonic world. We'll make war. Notice he didn't say might make war. He said they will make war. So demonic powers are portrayed here as making an all-out effort to destroy the church. Do they succeed? Well, what does it say? Make war with them and overcome them? Now, let me remind you right now, it appeared that that's what happened. It didn't, but it sure looked that way. And kill them? Yeah. Is there anybody left? I don't think so. And their dead bodies. Who are the dead bodies? This is the church. Pictured as dead bodies. Lying <coughs> in the street of the great city. All well, those dead bodies lying in the street remind you of what? Doesn't that bring to your mind the vision Ezekiel had of the Valley of Dry Bones? Which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt where also the Lord was crucified. Well, that's really telling, isn't it? When he speaks of these three locations, Sodom, of course, brings to our mind the worst kind of immorality. Uh, Egypt brings to our mind slavery. Uh, where the Lord is crucified brings to our mind death. These are the instruments of bringing the downfall. These are the people that are causing 
the problem against the church. <coughs> you know that sodomy now here refers primarily to homosexuality and lesbianism. The Bible speaks very, very clear on that subject. And it's so sad that so many people are so ignorant of God's word that they just kind of go along with what's happening in our world today without showing much concern. Slavery would be not be literal slavery, but spiritual slavery. Uh, preventing people from doing what they're supposed to do as Christians. Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations, these are all, that's four, that's talking about the whole world here, the non-Christian world, will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days. They're gloating over this. Hey, we, we killed them. The church is dead. There they are, look at them. Just gloating over them. Will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. Why not? Because when, in that day, if you didn't permit a body to be buried, that was on purpose. That was intended to insult as seriously and as greatly as possible. And those who dwell on the earth, referring to the non-Christian world, will rejoice over them, that is the church. Going to celebrate. How are they going to celebrate? They'll send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Two prophets are whom? The church. Formerly referred to as two witnesses, now called two prophets, just two different designations for the same group of people. Do the non-Christian world have any concern about the demise of the church? No, they're, they're going to be happy about that. In fact, many people in the non-Christian world are not comfortable around Christians. They just soon not talk to us. They just soon not listen to what we have to say. Well, the curtains close again. And, you know, I like to act one because that describes when the church is growing. Is there anything in history to suggest what might be included in Act 2? Yeah, I think so. Do you know what followed the time of Constantine? Constantine? It's recorded in church history as the Dark Ages. And during the Dark Ages, the church had so strayed away from the Word of God that many scholars studying history wonder, was there anybody, was there anybody <coughs> who was faithful to the Lord? Not a very pretty picture. And yet, then along came the Reformation movement, and after that, the Restoration movement, of which we're a part. So let's look at the last uh, picture here, which is tremendous. After three and a half days, this is a, talking about the Christians here now, this period of time, the church age, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. Again, I remind you of Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. Ezekiel said, speak to those bones. And he did. And one bone began to connect to another bone. And they began to take upon themselves flesh. And the city of the dead became a city of the living. And the people were amazed. They're shocked. Thought they were dead. That used to be a burial place. And now it's a place where people are very much alive and thriving. So those people who have been partying and rejoicing over the persecution of Christians are now experiencing great fear as they watch what's happening. And they heard a loud voice from heaven, this would be God's voice saying to them, come up here. Then they went up into heaven in the cloud. This refers to the second coming of Christ. He's gonna come in like manner as you've seen him go, coming in a cloud. We're gonna go up into heaven in the cloud and their enemies watched them. And in that hour there was a great earthquake. That's judgment. And the tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. The rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. So the drama comes to an end. And what happens? Does the church survive? Yes, it does. Now, my question to you is, where do you see yourself? Where do I see myself? Where do you see the church today in this three-act drama? I think we've already experienced Act 1. I think that's history. I think that Act 2 may be still with us. But I know Act 3 is coming. 
And that's what keeps me going. And I think all four of these pictures that we've been studying about today are there for us to be encouraged. God is so honest with us. And he says, it's not going to be easy. Look at Jesus. It wasn't easy for him. Can you not picture Jesus that night before he was crucified praying, God, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And yet with his faithfulness and trust, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. I think it's a picture like this that helps us to get through the rough times in life. I, I, I personally think that this three-act drama is lived out in congregations. I, I've known churches. I have one in mind right now. I'm not going to tell you where it is. Don't ask me. It's not in this state. I had a wonderful beginning. In fact, I preached for them when things were really going great. And now, they don't have any money to give to missions. They have spent so much money on a building that they didn't need. And a quality of stuff that they didn't need. That they're struggling to stay alive. And the last report I heard is they are almost dead. So what happens? Will the church ultimately be destroyed? Never. But those who remain faithful, even though they appear dead, those who remain faithful are going to be caught up when the Lord comes for His church. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for these pictures that you've portrayed to us today. We're so grateful for the privilege that you've given us to have heard the good news and now to be able to share it with other people. And you reminded us that there are some things that we just don't know and therefore do not fully understand. The voice of the seven thunders. There's something about judgment that we don't fully understand, we don't realize. But in light of everything that we do understand and realize, our faith is strong in you knowing that you're going to do what's right. But judgment is yours, not ours from the standpoint of condemnation. So help us to always hold out hope and to do the very best we can as long as we live. I thank you for the security that we have as members of the body of Christ, being the temple of the Holy Spirit. Even though we, like the rest of the world, go through tough times. And I pray that on those days that it looks like the world's crumbled in upon us, that we are tempted to give up hope that we won't. That we'll always remember that there is Act 3. And that we'll never forget David when he said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. But more importantly than that is the way he ended his song. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May that be our testimony. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Professor. Thank, Thank you. you.